People who are dying want to die in a chosen place uh, that is home or somewhere like home. And more relatives, relatively, are interested in people dying in supported settings. Now, there may be good reasons, and may, we may be able to understand why that's different. But we need, I think, also to be aware that proxy decision making is not always a good substitute for getting the people's opinions themselves. And we're also very clear that people want to be supported in the decision making, not simply being told it's their choice. They want to be given help in getting through that. We need to embrace the context of multimorbidity because very often the problem is people are supported in decision making around single disease processes rather than around their, their wider needs. Uh, some of you will be uh, aware of the work of Sean Morrison in New York. And uh, I once said to Sean, how did he learn to be a palliative care doctor? He said, I had to start on day one by forgetting everything I learned at medical school and then starting again and starting with a person and working down to the molecule, because everything he'd been taught had started with the molecule and gradually not completely worked up to the person. So the importance, I think, of understanding multimorbidity and the important decisions not to treat and not to intervene in certain problems where they are not a priority, given the wider context. And one of the things I'll be showing you in a moment <coughs> is the evidence that people with complex disease have a very different amount of uh, change when palliative care comes in as compared to people with single disease. It's much more likely to change the pattern of care if someone has complex needs. People want <coughs> the, the changing balance of intent. They don't want to switch a decision. I'm no longer worrying about your disease. I'm only worrying about symptoms. They want, as most palliative care people would well understand, they want a tapered switch from a more curative intent to a more palliative intent. They want timely and easy access to skills, and they want the care to be personalized. And uh, I'll come on to some more thoughts about this in just one moment. What do they want? Well, they want no hassle, and 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 they want no hassle. And as one elderly person said to me, it's bad enough to be dying. But trying to fight your way through the different entitlements, delivery organizations, priorities, agenda, and conflicting advice at a time when you don't have time and where you want the whole process to be simple. And one of the things I think that comes out of this is sometimes process is more important than what decision is actually made. People are much more interested in feeling that they got to where they got in a benign and sensible way rather than they got to where they got because it was an accident of all the things that were going on around them. They're really keen for it not to be a hassle to them and not to be a hassle to their, their families. And if you look at the way we organize care, even with the best intent, I think none of us could put our hands up and say we're not associated with it really being quite difficult to navigate your way through. People want it to be relatively simple to do so. It's always going to be complicated, but they want the pathway to be simple. They want some choice, but they want support with decision making. And as we're de designing better ways of supporting decision making, we need to realize people don't want to be left. It's your choice, sink or swim. They want it to be your choice, and I'm here to help you to navigate your way through what your options are. They want support for informal carers, but not to hand over all decision-making to informal carers. But what's really interesting about the role of informal carers, and I'll come on to this in a little more detail in a moment, is that it seems from our evidence that informal carers do exactly the same amount of effort and in terms of hours, regardless of how much formal care support there is. They just do different things. So what people are looking for is to let the informal carers do things that only informal carers can, and to take away from informal carers the kinds of roles and jobs that are actually better done by care workers and professional staff. And that frees people up to spend about the same time and effort, but to spend that time and effort in things that informal carers can do and others cannot. And they really don't want barriers and uh, stress on carers. And one of the things people most often said is, we want this to be my pathway because it will reduce the stress on my carers, not just because it's the pathway that will suit me best. <clears throat> 
We also know that what people want changes over time, so we have to be conscious of the fact that they need to change the provision gradually as the trajectory goes on towards the end of life. And it differs hugely by age and disease. Younger people want much more participation in decision making. People dying of ALS, which we have a, a big study that's been looking at people dying of ALS, want very much more participation in the decision making than people who are dying of cancer. People dying with a single disease are typically much clearer about what sorts of uh, care they're looking for than people who have got complex multiple morbidities. But they really want access to be easy. And this is actually a little bit of a problem sometimes because sometimes people want access but then don't use it. You know, I laid this service on and then they didn't bloody use it. You, you've probably been in that situation yourselves. You thought, I went to all this effort. And then they said, well, actually, I'm fine. You're, you've been through that. But what we found from looking carefully at people's preferences is they were really keen on availability, even if on a particular day they decided not to use it. And they really want good access, particularly to good symptom management, regardless of anything else. And they have what economists call lexicographic preferences. That's to say they won't even think about hairdressing and yoga until you've sorted out access to symptom control. And anyone here who is supporting people in yoga, I am not trying to be denigrating. I'm, uh, I've never done yoga myself, actually. It would be a complete lie to say I know exactly what I'm talking about. I know nothing about what I'm talking about. But uh, people do want these other characteristics, but they don't want them at the expense of getting good access to timely, good symptom management. And they do want, if possible, to die in a preferred setting, although the preferred setting may well change over time, and we need to be sensitive to that. <coughs> so what do we know about getting better value in palliative care and better value for, for the services that are provided for people with complex needs and people near the end of life? <laughs> Well, we do have some really very good evidence that skilled palliative care decision making in the hospital setting lowers cost, particularly in cases where it is early in the trajectory of care. <laughs> Getting in early is the critical thing. And there are many studies that failed to show that, not nearly as good as our ones. And they collected just as good data and then they screwed up on the analysis. And so we feel terribly pleased with ourselves because we collected equally good data and didn't screw up on the analysis. But what we can see is there are significantly lower costs of hospital care if someone on admission to hospital is given a good team palliative care assessment if their needs are complex. And it very significantly reduces the care. And the earlier you do it, the more it reduces the cost of care. It reduces the amount of surgery. It reduces the amount of intensive care time. It reduces the amount of drugs people are on in total. And it seems to be associated not only with better reported quality of life, but also with probably longer life. So if we can get good decision making into the hospital setting, we have good evidence that it can lower cost. And if something can lower cost and produce good outcomes, only a fool, or a politician, no, not a politician, only a fool could possibly be opposed to it. Now, <clears throat> we know that savings are greater when they're earlier, but we also know that the more complex the person's needs, the bigger the savings. And these savings, as I said, are associated with evidence of improved process, improved experience, and in some cases, improved survival. So this seems to me the really easy end of trying to improve the way we work. And we're currently doing some work looking at putting palliative care nurse practitioners into emergency departments, what you call A&E here, where we are trying to see, particularly if we can catch the frequent flyers, the people who are constantly reappearing because their needs are not being well managed, and see if we can turn them into people who have their complex needs managed in a coherent way. I'm just giving an example of how we're taking the knowledge that we know you can lower cost and improve outcomes if you get good decision making early on and trying to get practical settings. We've also got a nice experiment going on in Dublin at the moment where in one hospital, a palliative care consultant takes 50% of the take for cancer patients being admitted and see whether those who are admitted under the palliative care consultant because it happens to be his day on take, 
have a different experience from those who are <coughs> on take from the oncologists. It's going to be really interesting to see if we can replicate these kinds of findings. Putting skilled decision making into critical times can lower cost and can produce better outcomes. We know that uh, palliative care interventions lower the cost of an episode of care. But one of the problems this might, might bring, it's not a problem I'm unhappy about, but one of the problems is if people live longer, then they may go on costing for a bit longer. So we can't be sure that it's purely saving money, but it does produce a better outcome, and that better outcome may be at a lower, the same, or at a marginally higher cost, but it is a better outcome. We know that uh, the economic evaluation of palliative care study, which looked at uh, retrospectively of the experiences of people in uh, three different parts of Ireland, found that those who got good access to palliative care early in their disease trajectory did cost very slightly more from the time that they were first referred till the time they died as compared to people who got rather poor access. And the poor access came as a result of the unavailability of service rather than the, the lack of, of, of willingness. And, uh, we did find, though, that the difference in cost was so small as to be almost invisible, and only a very few people died in hospital when they got early access to palliative care skills, and large proportion died in hospital when they got late access. So it was very clear that getting good access changed the place of death. In this case, it slightly increased costs, but very clearly improved the trajectory of care. And uh, what was most interesting, though, is that people who knew about the different kinds of care were very clear that they didn't want to die in hospital, they didn't want to go into hospital, but those who didn't know any better thought hospital was fine. So we could see the ratings of hospital care being very different between those who had an experience of a specialist palliative care approach to care against those who, who had only known hospital care in its most conventional forms. We know, though, that single index measures in this area don't really show very convincing differences in outcome. And people are very keen to try and make palliative care economic research look just like other health economics research. The problem with trying to do this is the kinds of measure that are reasonably good at showing the improvements in cataract surgery or in uh, hip replacement don't work very well when you try and put them into the complex setting of people with multiple morbidities, complex needs, and very different uh, mixtures of medical and social and emotional and spiritual needs. So we are trying to look at other ways of introducing measurement here. And a lot of the work we're doing at the moment is trying to test out a number of different approaches to measurement to see if we can get better value that way. But there are difficulties in general in assessing costs and outcomes in complex settings. If you have individualized care, it's very difficult to randomize someone to one lot of individualized care against another lot of individualized care because it wouldn't be individualized if people were randomized. So a lot of the conventional methods of doing research are really quite difficult to apply in this setting. And, uh, we also have difficulty that quite a lot of what people want is contingent. If I need it, I want it to be there. And you know, if you say to someone, if I need a cataract operation, I want it to be there, you can say, yes, that's fine, but you can wait a few months. And you probably will have to wait a few months, so that's a realistic position. But in some senses, that's not catastrophic. But if you say, I want good symptom management, and I want it to be available whenever I need it, the day you need it and it's not there is a much more serious problem. So we really have a problem with contingent needs, which are quite often an important part of what someone is looking for in their, in their access to services. And we also have the complex interweaving of formal and informal care. And our work is suggesting, if you look at the pure cost in terms of time off work, time and petrol costs and all these other things that informal carers incur, they can often be many times higher than the costs of the formal care that people are receiving. So the interweaving between the two makes it very complicated. A lot of different organizations are involved and in working out what the costs are in organizations that have some charitable support, organizations that have different kinds of statutory funding, again, that makes it very hard. The, uh, <laughs> 
Simple outcome measures are simple and they really don't ad adequately capture the complex interventions. And we really need, when we're doing this kind of evaluation, to use a number of different complex measures. And uh, one of the big problems is most measures of outcome in healthcare research assume that time can be added up. You know, if you have three months in this, it's not as good as four months in this. You know, four months is always better than three. Has anyone heard of Daniel Kahneman, the, uh, the sort of psych psychologist, economist, Nobel Prize winner? You should have heard of him if you haven't. Uh, I just suggest you read everything he's written because it's probably good for you. Um, but he has an idea which is called the peak and end rule, which says essentially a two-week holiday is not necessarily worse than a three-week holiday. <laughs> But what you really want is a holiday that has one wow event and one, a holiday that ends well. If you've got no wow event and it ends badly, three weeks can be a miserable holiday, <laughs> even if day by day it looks exactly the same. Now, this is a real challenge to the way we think because people often say, well, but we did get a little bit of extra days in this state, but people may not be interested in comparing a trajectory with more days in a particular state unless it's associated with, I say, a wow event or a good end. And I think the peak and end rule has particular resonance in palliative care research because we know it has an end. There is a need for the end to be good. <laughs> and looking at this kind of thinking, I think, can be very valuable. But it's a real problem. We need outcome measures that don't simply add up all the experiences people have, because the whole tends not to be equal to the sum of the parts. So we need to try and think of ways of measuring trajectories of care rather than measuring episodes of care. <laughs> and we need to accept that people's preferences don't seem to fulfill all the needs of economists all the time. You know, economists like people to have a particular kind of rationality. Unfortunately, people insist on not having that kind of rationality. So Joanna Coast and uh, colleagues have done some very interesting work using a, an instrument called ICECAP, which is trying to get holistic measurement of outcomes and experience, looking at these other dimensions. And I think it's quite worth looking at that, not necessarily to use it, but, use, but in order to understand some of the thinking that goes with it. So how do we build the evidence base? Well, one of the problems is people say, well, can you show that palliative care is cost effective? People have said that to me in many occasions, and I just look at them sadly, because they clearly don't understand. Palliative care is not a thing. It's not a thing that can or cannot be cost effective. Palliative care is many, many things, and it's an approach, and it's a way of thinking of things. So we need to evaluate the things as much as need to evaluate the programs of care overall. And we need to... Start off, though, by arguing always in favor of things that cost nothing and, and achieve more. And I think a lot of this has got to do with getting skilled decision-making into the right times in the trajectory of someone's needs. And skilled decision-making is almost always team-based, and it's almost always crossing over between people with specialisms in the more biomedical, the more nursing care, and the more social needs that, and spiritual needs that a person has. So team-based interventions early on seem to be no-brainers, generally. They produce better outcomes at lower cost. <laughs> it's always going to be difficult with the metrics because there are short time scales. You know, if you save a baby, you may get 80 years. If you save a person within weeks of death, you only get the weeks to death. So p the metrics are often made more difficult by short time scales. The, com the interventions are often complex and difficult to capture, and so research is more difficult there. And the objectives are more complex. You're not simply looking to produce a very simple improvement in a linear outcome. But we do know that some palliative care extends life. And one of the things I think we've got to be very bold about I mean, bold in not the... Do you know the Irish meaning of bold? It just means bad in Ireland. I discovered that after about eight years living in Ireland. I discovered that my compliments were not being taken the right way. <laughs> but uh, we have to be very bold about arguing that sometimes a palliative intent extends life. And there is good evidence that in some circumstances a palliative care intent extends life as compared to a curative intent. We know that some reductions in cost will happen where needs are complex if we get good decision-making into the system. So we can easily argue for that. 
We need to improve the experiences of families more widely, and that will really mean we need to prioritize making the access processes as easy as possible, reducing the number of barriers, and making the barriers less complex. Outcome tools need to try and incorporate these different dimensions because if they only incorporate the life expectancy and the narrowly defined quality of life of the person who is receiving care, that will be inadequate. We know, though, that people can articulate their preferences quite well and want to. And anyone who says it's not ethical to do research on people who are dying, it is not ethical not to do research on people who are dying. They want to help. Indeed, I've had some great difficulties sometimes getting the researcher out of the context. Um, I made the great mistake of having a beautiful Italian man doing some of the interviews in one of the studies I was involved in. We needed to get a, a crane and a forklift truck to lift him out of the setting to get him away. But people want to participate, they want to help, they want to give. We, need, we know that People articulate a hierarchy of wants. They want specific needs to be dealt with much more immediately and more fully, than, and then they will think about their other needs. They're no good at saying, well, yes, I'd quite like some hairdressing. Oh, I won't, I won't have my symptom control today. I think I have a bit more hairdressing. It doesn't look like that at all. But really improving access seems to me to be the one thing that's clearest here, and it almost certainly will be associated with no significant increase in cost and maybe some reductions in cost. So what are we trying to do with economic evaluation here? We're trying to work out what services should be provided, how they should be provided, and who should get what. These are the key things we're looking at. It's about trying to provide evidence that allows priorities to be set. And I've given some indications, I think, of where I think they should be set. So evaluation of palliative care is difficult and important. And I think we must never allow the sentimental tendencies in us to say, well, we really shouldn't be asking difficult questions. If we're doing something that's not much good, we should stop doing it. And we should do something that's more useful. We don't have the spare capacity in terms of skills and abilities to waste our time. I don't think many people are wasting their time, but I think many people could be doing more useful jobs if they could only free up some of their time from the things that are less useful. We'll never have simple measures of complex needs and complex interventions, but we need to find ways of comparing the complex measurements with the simple ones elsewhere. Because we really will only succeed in a fight for higher levels of resource if we can provide better evidence that is more convincing and easier to, uh, to compare to other things. And if you have been listening, thank you very much. <laughs>
what we try and do is, is make sure that we measure everything that's there in order that we can aggregate things in the different ways we're looking at. I mean, clearly, you know, we, we've got into ridiculous uh, terminological issues around specialist and generalist palliative care and things. Every time I hear people say that, I despair because I've got no idea what they mean. But uh, what it's trying to get at is the complexity of the fact that most services that are useful to people who have palliative needs will not be provided with someone with a lab by someone with a label. And uh, so we do need to, once we've got hold of the person, we find out everything we possibly can about what, what needs are being met. We're trying to set up a European study at the moment that will be very specifically recruiting um, people and putting a palliative team intervention into that setting regardless of whether there was one there or not at the beginning. So, I mean, we, we face this dilemma all the time, is the honest answer. Only people at the back are allowed to ask questions, and Sir? you'll find. And only the minority of the men, who are the people who are not women. <laughs> it's sort of a follow-on from the last question from David Gray. Um, as a GP, I'm conscious that the, 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 an awful lot of the palliative care that we prescribe is clearly generalist palliative care. I would define that as being done by generalists rather than specialists. I think it is a relatively straightforward split to make. Um, in the care home that we supply services to, I think, I'd have to have the exact figures, but I think in the last 18 months, there's been, I think, 21 deaths. None of these people have had any involvement from specialist palliative care services. And therefore, I would imagine that they would all be completely under the radar of what we're looking at here. But they do have a vast amount of time input from general practice, mm -hmm. a vast amount of time input from the care teams within the care home, yeah. massive input from SALT, massive input from old age psychiatry. Mm -hmm. All of these services are heavily involved. And so when you say that, that, that care of old people who are dying, because these are dying people clearly because they died, is cheaper, I, I wonder whether we're measuring the right things. Well. I'd say we are, we're now specifically trying to look at people who have not been, I mean, it's much easier to find people who are in touch with specialist palliative care services, or at least named palliative care services, than other people who are dying. So, I mean, I think I, I would be absolutely with you on saying this is important to understand what the other stories are. I'm not, uh, when I was saying I don't know what about generalist and, pallet, uh, and specialist, <laughs> I think it leads to a lot of confusion when people draw these distinctions because within what is described as specialist palliative care, you have a huge variation even within that of the kinds of organizations and kinds of services that are provided. So I don't think it, it's a tidy split. But I think the point that I was trying to start off with at the beginning is that I think you know, in many senses, the problem is the world out of line with us rather than us out of line with the world. That's to say, trying to get some of the understanding that people who work specifically in palliative care have, have gathered can be useful more widely. Now, GPs have always been in the forefront of providing what conventionally we would think of as palliative interventions. They, more than any other professional group, are dealing with, the, with, with this population of people who have got complex needs. And I think, in many senses, GPs are more naturally specialist in palliative care than people who are trained as physicians who then come back into it. So I'm, I'm not in any way trying to suggest that people aren't doing very serious and, and in many cases, very good work. What I think is clear, though, is that if you suddenly say, let's really think about this as a, a, a a set of complex needs where we need to try and develop a strategy for better management of, of this, this person's needs. That does seem to be associated, at least in some settings, with people making different and better decisions. And it's quite clear that teams, and sometimes in primary care you do have genuinely good teams, sometimes in primary care the teams are, are more, more theoretical, but that teamwork seems to make a big difference by bringing the different priorities onto a more level playing field. But we are never going to be in a position where GPs and uh, community nursing and, and, uh, and other welfare services are not critical to making this work. It's just trying to help people to navigate through it better. And uh, you know, I, uh, I've had three relatives die in Tobermory, and uh, all three of them 
had very good palliative care and it was never labeled. You know, so I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that the recent good decision making there, but we were lucky with having GPs who were people, were clearly human beings who gave us their mobile phone numbers who, you know, who were really engaged in, in, in trying to help that way. Sorry, I've, I've gone on too long on that. Okay. We've got time for one last question. At the, I don't know if we can get the microphone down to the front. That would be great. It's on its way, Scott. Thanks so much, Charles, for a really tremendous uh, lecture indeed. You give us an example of promoting early palliative care in the hospital A&E there. Could you give us some other examples that you could possibly think about by specialists or generalists, in fact? Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think the, the, two, the two examples I gave there happen to be <coughs> the, the population, 100% population of the studies I'm currently involved in trying to do this. But what we've been <coughs> looking at, uh, and we're particularly hoping to get out of this study of people who don't get referral into any named palliative care service, um, will be to try and pick up people um, on discharge from hospital. Because very often, <coughs> elderly people discharged from hospital are essentially discharged without a coherent plan about what's to be done. And I, <coughs> with my other hat on, I'm uh, till recently the chairman of a hospital board in Dublin. And our priority, if we were honest about it, is to empty a bed because a full bed is a real problem. <laughs> and uh, we, we like to think we try very hard to empty it well, but in the end of the day, emptying it at all is a, is a huge part of the priorities. And I think trying to capture better people at discharge from um, particularly repeat acute episodes of admission into, into hospital is, is, is a promising area. It's rather similar to getting people at the beginning of a hospital episode. It's saying this is someone who's recognized to have complex problems and we should be more proactively trying to plan for their management. I mean, clearly one of the depressing things is you in some senses have to be a graduate of the hospital system to get good community services. And we noticed this a lot with my brother because my brother had Down syndrome and uh, he never was in a long stay institution, which was a real problem because when they started closing the long stay institutions, they were providing community services for people who had been. And then they suddenly found there was just as many people out there who hadn't been. <laughs> and that clogged up the whole system and, and nobody knew how to manage. So being a graduate of secondary care seems to me a bad criterion but very often a common criterion for people saying, let's think clearly about what, what the person's needs are. So I'd be looking at, but I think within the primary care community, slightly more formal thinking about when is the point at which we start a process of repeat reviews uh, on a more systematic basis, on a multidisciplinary basis. I'm sure a lot of that is happening at the moment. It probably could be more formalized. And I think it'd be really interesting to see whether introducing more formalized repeat assessments there will make a difference to the trajectories of care people get. Thank you very much.